Hi, I'm Jill, editor of Reader's Digest, and this month we've got a real treat for anyone who's ever gone into their doctor's surgery and come out later and thought, why didn't I ask them this, that or the other? Um, because there's just not enough time. Well, there is enough time now because I had Dr. Max Pemberton locked into the room with me to answer your questions. Max, welcome. Hi, <laughs> Are you ready for the answer? I, I am, as long as you're going to be gentle with me, it's fine. Okay. I'll do my best. Um, okay, first question. When I was in hospital recently, I kept being offered sleeping pills when I didn't really want them. In what circumstances do you think they're really necessary? Okay. Should you just take them if they're Well, this is, I think, a really, really sensible question. Um, it's one of those things, lots of doctors dish out sleeping pills, mm. I think probably a little bit too readily. Mm. Um, the, I suppose the first thing to say is uh, there are two broad types of sleeping pills. The first one is it's easy to remember, they all begin with the letter Z. Oh, like so Z. Exactly, yeah. so like, so no. think of like yeah. sleeping. No. Um, and, and the common ones are, are Zopiclone and Zolpidem. Right. They're, the kind of, they're the common Z drugs, as they're called. Um, now, um, they, have, they, they don't have too many side effects. Um, they're not too sedating. Um, my concern, however, is the other group um, of drugs that are sometimes used, um, and that the term for those are called the benzodiazepines. Um, yeah. And they're easy to know that you're taking one because they all end in the letter PAM. So lorazepam, uh, tamazepam, so diazepam. Beware, beware PAM. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but now, when would you be offered those instead well, of the Z one? It's actually just down to the doctor. Now, the, the, right. the, the issue with the benzodiazepines is they're, they're quite effective, they, they're, they're good sleeping pills, um, but they are addictive um, if you take them from really more than a couple of days, right. um, and they, um, you can build up a tolerance to them. Um, also, particularly in older people, um, they um, can make you very, very sedated. In fact, I've had patients where I've stopped their tamazepam that they're taking, and okay, actually they've like, come back to life. Um, because is that because they're processing the drugs more slowly? Or? Yeah, exactly, oh, exactly. Okay. So okay. even though some, in some people they build up a tolerance, in older people um, it can just be that it just, just takes them so up. long to break down the tablet you know, during the night that actually in, they have a thing called like a hangover effect, right. so that in the morning they're still half asleep. Um, so I, I think sleeping tablets have their place. Certainly if you're having problems sleeping, then it, you know, it ruins people's lives and it's really important you go yeah, to the doctor sure. and you, 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 you speak to them about it and sometimes the treatment for that does sometimes involve a short course of a sleeping tablet and that, that's but, fine. But basically if it begins with Z, probably not too much to worry about. If it ends in PAM... I would be more cautious be about it and careful. certainly if you're in hospital, that's a very unusual environment and often these tablets are given out in hospital just because there's so much going on and people find it hard to sleep. And in those circumstances, yeah. if you are having difficulty, you know, I'd much rather you had a nice night's sleep. Um, so you know, don't be too wary, okay. particularly if it's Zopiclone or Zolpidem. But by always ask what tablet you're being given. Make sure you know, ask what the side yes, effects always are. Always check, always check. Absolutely. I think people just automatically Yeah, don't just take yeah. a tablet. Yeah. And certainly if, you know, as I, I've seen many, many times, when the nurse wakes somebody up to yeah. say, would you like a sleeping tablet? <laughs> I mean, in those situations, like, oh, I've got to want to wring people's necks. I think I've been there, yeah, actually. So you have to be, so, so it's, <laughs> think about it sensibly, and when in doubt, ask questions. Yeah. It's okay to do that. Okay, all right, second question. If I decide to pay for a hip operation privately, because maybe it's faster. Does that mean I have to pay for everything associated with that condition for the rest of my life, or can I go on to use the NHS afterwards? Hmm. Right, very, very good question, very sensible. Hmm. Um, and of course, you know, immediately we think about things like the breast, um, uh, the, the PIP breast enlargement um, yeah. uh, implants, yeah. um, which you know cause a big scandal and so on and so on. And 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 lots of people had to to deal with these issues then. Yeah. Now. It's very, very important when you undertake a procedure privately that you do have enough money that you can afford for all of the stuff, that, that all the costs that might be incurred subsequently, but not forever. Though. Right. So, so things like physiotherapy, occupational therapy, having um, and uh, drugs. You have to pay yes, for all your drugs. Yes, as well. exactly. Having changes to your um, and adaptations to your house. All of those things. So, with a hip operation, that can add up. To quite a lot, mm. um, um, and I have seen people. It's you know a couple of extra thousands sometimes. There are some surgeons that will um, include it in a whole package, so they will say you know for eight thousand pound or ten thousand pound, I'll do your hip, right. but that includes absolutely right. everything. But what if it's, something subsequently went wrong? Well, though? if something afterwards, so say five or ten years down the line, it, the, it, it failed, that, yeah. which hip operations do do sometimes um, have 
it does happen to them sometimes. They've only got a limited shelf life. Yes. Um, so you know, within usually about 20 years, you, you might think, you might get away with a bit, a bit more, but usually about 20 years, you, you have to think, to the NHS, this might need to be re revised. You could then go yeah. back to the NHS. If it's still here in 20 years' time. Well, yeah, fingers crossed. Because yeah. it's in a separate problem. The fact it's a, a problem that, okay. that, that, that has okay. a basis of something that you had done privately doesn't yeah. really matter. So, but the big question is just making sure you've got enough money to cover for all eventualities. Yeah, in, yeah. in, in that short term that, cover, that surround that operation. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, next question. Um, I don't know the answer to this one at all, but you're the doctor, you might. Um, my 14-year-old daughter has got moderate scoliosis, which I think is curvature of the spine, isn't it? That's right, yeah. Um, but I don't really want her to have an operation because it's such a major thing to have. How bad does it have to be in order for an operation to be crucial? What are the alternatives? Now, obviously you can't see this daughter or how no. moderate the scoliosis is. Yes. What would your general advice be then? Well, the thing... What I would say to start off with is scoliosis, you know, it sounds like a scary thing. Um, um, it's actually relatively common. It's not at all uncommon. I've, I've got mild scoliosis. I was going to say, do you know who else has got it? No, you. No. no. <laughs> um, Usain Bolt. Oh, yes, it. I know. Actually, and actually, it, it, didn't read it's a slightly, Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. it's actually, and it's fairly, it's fairly um, serious with him. It's not, it's not a mild thing. Yeah. Um, it's, his right leg, I think, is, is shorter by yes, about one and a half yes. centimetres. It's yeah. actually quite, yeah. quite a marked... Yeah. Um, a, a marked difference. Um, so, so you can function perfectly fine um, with, with a scoliosis. It doesn't mean you have to undergo surgery. And to be honest, all orthopaedic surgeons um, would you know, say, well, first of all, we're going to try and treat this conservatively, so we're going to try and not do anything. Yeah. Um, then if we need to, we'll do physiotherapy, we'll make adaptations, we'll try braces, we'll try all different things before we'd ever resort so, to surgery. So it would be a last resort. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, always okay. something that happens okay. after everything else has been yeah. tried. So it's not something a parent would necessarily have to decide themselves, no. they'd be guided towards... Absolutely. Yeah. And what I would say is, even if it does get to the stage where surgery is being discussed, always, always, always ask for a second opinion. Mm. And any surgeon mm. worth their salt will be pleased that you've asked for a second it's opinion. It's a huge operation. My yeah. niece had it done. She had metal rods It's a really in big, invasive, yeah. serious procedure. And a surgeon would want a colleague yeah. to have given a second okay. opinion. That's so it's absolutely fine. You can go to your battery GP and say, you know, we've been discussing this with the surgeon. Right to, to get a and I'd like a second opinion. Yeah. And they will arrange it. Okay. And that's perfectly fine to do. Yeah, that's good advice. Thank you. Right, next one. Now, this is, I bet this is a very common one. I've always taken extra vitamin C and calcium tablets, but I keep hearing scare stories about they increase your risk of cancer. What's your view on supplements, etc.? Well, again, a brilliant, brilliant question. I really like these questions <laughs> because I'm going to be honest. I take lots of supplements yeah. every day. Uh -huh. It's true, and now I know yeah, the, science, <laughs> the science. The um, science would say that I don't really need to. There's if no you evidence. Eat a good balanced exactly. Diet. If you eat a good balanced mm. diet, you don't really need to. Now, I do take vitamin C, and the reason I take vitamin C is it's a water soluble vitamin, which means so that your body can't it. save it exactly. Yeah. So you need new stuff. You need more of it every day. Yeah. And to be honest, I do. I try to eat a healthy diet, as I'm sure everyone does, yeah. but I don't always succeed. Um, so I just kind of think I like in the back of my mind to think, yeah. you know, what, I've taken that. Yeah. Now, when you look at the at the evidence supporting vitamins it's not very good but actually also when you look at the um, evidence suggesting that it's in some way detrimental it's also not really very good um, the, the, so you're you saying nobody these, really knows well you always get these scare <laughs> stories that come out um, they often done in very small samples there's lots of other complicating factors that might have influenced the results um, you can see how it's very difficult for consumers or uh, calcium which I know, I, very, I know people difficult. taking calcium now, to ward off osteoporosis exactly so now what there do you are do? some people so, so, so if you have for example osteoporosis which is thinning of the bones yeah. that would class as a you know, you'd be, then be classed as someone with an unusual requirement for calcium right um, so I suppose you would then be in a different category and you would often get that prescribed for you um, by your doctor and that then becomes a different thing okay. I suppose we're thinking just more about general just preventive medicine to be honest um, calcium I'm, I'm I don't take a calcium supplement yeah. um, I um, drink lots of milk right. and drink skimmed milk not semi skimmed or full fat because okay. skimmed milk has got more calcium as well as less fat um, so you've got much much more calcium in okay. skimmed milk have a glass of skimmed milk and if you look actually Glass of skin oil has got about the same amount of calcium as a calcium tablet has. Well, what, so what about a general multivitamin pill then? Multivitamin and multimineral? Personally, I don't think there's any harm. Okay. Um, if it makes you okay. feel a bit better, um, 
um, in yourself feeling you know more confident thinking do you know what I've had my I know, um, I've covered off the I've bases covered everything. <laughs> do you know what I don't mind I, yeah, actually I quite like it it's people taking an active role in their health the ones to worry about are the ones that are fat soluble yeah. that can be stored exactly so things like A, a you have to be really careful with, with vitamin yeah. A and to some extent with vitamin D right. um, you do have to be careful with those I mean vitamin A is, is the one that everyone talks about okay um, um, but again, they're, they're actually even in the supplements, in the you know multivitamin supplements, they're in still quite a small amount. So, so, so basically, you'd give multivitamins just that general kind of covering all bases, taking. Yeah, I, I think that's fine. And there are certain health. situations. Um, so, vitamin C has got no evidence that it helps with colds, although yeah. zinc has. So, if you want to take the zinc supplement when you've got a cold, right. that has been shown to yeah. reduce only slightly, but it has been yeah. ch- okay. chance to improve your cold. But with um, you know post-operatively. Um, so after an operation, um, I often tell either my patients and perhaps my family members take lots of vitamin C. Right, because I'll do that it now. helps you helps yeah. you your, your your skin knit back together again. Yeah. But you actually don't need a tablet. <laughs> you can eat a bag of oranges, which is what I do. Literally, all my family hate me because I'm always sitting there going, "Eat Satsumas." Oh, your room must smell so fragrant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now let's, mm, I can imagine this happening. My husband is getting chest pains and just won't go to the doctor. That's male behaviour. He says they're just shooting pains and to do with indigestion. How do I know if they're a serious problem or not? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure, as you say, this question would resonate with lots and lots of women. Um, I mean, how, how does she know? How does he know, um, is the question. Um, how bad how do does chest pains have know? to be? Um, and my concern, I mean, it could be lots and lots of things. He's right, it could be indigestion. Yeah. Um, yeah. But to be honest, if you're having shooting pains from indigestion, I would think, well, even if it is indigestion, what's yeah. going on there? Yeah. Um, you know, is this actually an ulcer that needs treating? Yeah. Um, to be honest, though, any kind of chest pain, you should always, always assume it's cardiac, so it's heart, yeah. um, until proven otherwise, yeah. because that is, you know, it's one of the most serious things it could be. Yeah. You've got to exclude and what's that first. The harm? What's I know the exactly. Harm I mean, honestly, checking. drives me mad, doesn't it? Because it's so yeah. easy. Ten minutes in the doctor, they would do a tracing of the heart, take yeah. seconds, yeah. so quick and easy. And you're Probably wouldn't fine. even necessarily need blood tests. So quick. Um, to just Are you sort listening, out what's boys? Going on. Yeah. Do as you're told. <laughs> Wagging our fingers <laughs> at you. Um, you know, it, it, it breaks my heart because I see so many times. I see what happens is when it people fear, don't. Or is it kind of? It's particularly. I think to it's, it's 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 a defence mechanism where mm. they just kind of think. Do you know what? If I pretend I it's not happening, it. and I, you know, I'm just as bad. I had a cough for five months. Max. I, I know. I had a cough for five months and I just ignored it, ignored it, ignored it. As it was, you know, it turned out to be fine. Yeah. But of course, it could have been something really, really serious. And it wasn't until, and actually a patient said, do you know you've had that cough for such a long time? And I thought, okay, a patient, oh, okay. So I was <laughs> and then my sister said, we've all been talking about it in the family. Um, we're really worried. And then I thought, do you know what, 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 would, it, what would it take to get I me think to everybody to by law ought to have an appointment every month with a doctor. So <laughs> and, and it's that they have to go to anyway. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's my so, solution. So I would say he right. does need to, it could be He's anything. got to go. Even, go. If, even if it's indigestion, yeah, that go. would be unusual to get that level of pain that frequently yeah. just from indigestion. Right, so go. he should go. It's easy, it'll be over and done within five minutes. I think that's unequivocal, thank you. Yeah. Um, now, this is, this is interests me, actually. Would you advise having one of those full body scans to try and catch any potential problems early on? That's where you have a, is it a CT scan? What's, yes, yeah. yeah that's, I mean, there's a whole variety of different um, quite expensive. screening. They are very, very expensive. Yeah. And, of course, there is always these stories of people finding you know, these undiagnosed tumours yeah. and so on and so on, and people think, oh, yeah. right, I would, yeah. I would be quite definite on this, and I would say no. Now the reason right. for that, there's several. Yeah. The first one is that if you look at what um, the dose of radiation you get from a CT scan, yeah. from a full body CT scan, it's thousands of x-rays Ooh. worth. Um, it's you know a significant amount of radiation you're exposing your body to. Now I would always be very, for me there would have to be a very, very good reason before I would go into a CT scanner, right. uh, particularly for a full body one. So you're having, a, you know, it's an enormous thing. The other thing, and this is the, the real reason why, is that when you do these kind of just blind searches for things, and you don't really know what you're looking for, um, you will inevitably find things something. that could be something. Mm. Um, and you then are invasively uh, investigated for it, mm. and that can create other problems in itself. Now, for example, my mum yeah. had a brain scan for something entirely different, yeah. and they found a little tumour. Yeah. Now, if she'd been on one of these things, then, you know, it would cause massive anxiety, 
she'd have gone there, you know, possibly had to go and be seen by a neurosurgeon. Actually, she's had that tumour her whole life. Right. It's just a benign little okay. thing, it's nothing. Okay. But actually on a scan, it looks really, really serious, but actually they haven't have known she's had it her whole life, so right. it's not a big deal. Now, if you didn't know that, it would have been aggressively investigated. Um, and, and the thing is, you hear about these stories of people having their lives saved. Well. Yeah. What you don't hear about is the proportionally of hundreds and thousands of other people that, that have stuff mm. needlessly investigated, have needless procedures. You can see why people do it, the, because exactly, they're trying course, to take responsibility for their health. And, and, all, and it's, you know, it's all the complications that come with all these procedures yeah. that people have. This is what concerns me. And, 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 I, and, I, and I completely understand it. People trying to be proactive about their health, and that's something, you know, I love that. But with these particular things, there's no evidence mm. for them. All the evidence suggests that actually they create more harm than they ever, you know, that they ever right. sort of sort well, out. I think that's clear then. Um, so, you A know, if you, if you are Max. worried about something, your health in general, much better. Go and have your blood pressure taken, yeah. have an ECG yeah. done. You can have this done at your GPs yeah. and, um, and, you know, get a general check over, get general bloods done. It's yeah. free, yeah. quick and easy, and it's all proven. Yes, um, I, I, a doctor once said to me, just have your blood, a full blood test every yeah. couple of years. No harm. And have that, that will done. show up. Have your blood up. pressure taken yeah. um, and, and have an ECG. If it's you have that done. cheaper as well. Yeah, it would be free Thanks, in the NHS. Saved us if you turn up to a GP, they'll do it for free. Right, okay. <laughs> I'll book you in. Um, okay, next question. I'm very scared about going into hospital soon. I think I've read too many scare stories in the Daily Mail. I'm sure you have. <laughs> what can I do to make sure I'm okay? Oh, no, that's, I can see that. Because yeah, you hear these stories, I'm going to come up with MRSA with worse no, things than I went in. Is there a kind uh, of general thing you should do to kind of just protect yourself? I, I do feel really bad because, of course, I do sometimes write for the Daily Mail. Oh, no. um, and I, so I do feel bad <laughs> that I contributed to this. And I would hate to think that anybody... I mean, it sort of upsets me to, to think that people um, you know, read all these various stories, which I have to say I yeah. don't write, yeah. but all these various stories, yeah. um, um, and, and, and then take it to heart. Of course they do. And, and then they're scared to go in hospital. Yeah. When they happen, they're you know, disgusting and disgraceful. They make me really angry that mm. people haven't received an excellent uh, level of care uh, uh, under the NHS, um, but they are isolated incidents. You know, right. They are not common. The, the NHS treats millions of people every year, um, and you know, the, these stories represent a tiny, tiny fraction of it. Try not to worry about going to hospital. Um, I would say there are some things you can yeah, well, do. What can you, what can you do just to make yeah. yourself feel a bit more So secure. if you're going into hospital, it's obviously it's an elective procedure, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah. It's not an emergency, yeah. because you know you're going in. Yeah. Um, really, really useful to bring in your medication with you. Yeah. You don't necessarily have to bring in the actual medication, but bring in a list of everything of that you're take. on. They should have it, the GP yeah. should have given it to them, but just in, just case, in case, just in case. Um, if you've got an underlying or some other condition, um, make sure that not only the doctor's aware of it, but that the doctors who are looking after the other condition you have right. are also aware that you're going into hospital, just right. so there's some kind of communication so like between those two. So you've got diabetes two. but you're going in for a heart Exactly, operation. exactly. Make sure your diabetic doctor knows that, you've also, yeah. you, you, that you're going in for a heart operation and vice versa yeah. and so on and so on. Make sure there's some communication. You can facilitate that. Yeah. Um, make sure you know who your consultant is make sure you've got their name yeah. and that you've met them. Yeah. Um, I'm always, I always find it extraordinary that people go into hospital and they're treated and they don't know who's they're treating them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, they kind of say, well, this person came and gave me this tablet, or this person came and did this to me. And you, go, you say, well, who are they? And they go, I don't know. They go, well, you know, were they a consultant or were they the cleaner? You know, you've got no clue who people are. And my mum does exactly the same, and I'm always kind of like haranguing her about it. <laughs> you know, she, she's just come out of hospital. Oh. Um, and I was like, I can't believe you're allowing people to treat you, don't know who they are. Um, and it does make a difference, because if somebody tells you a piece of information and they're the consultant or the registrar, it's very different than if they're, say, the healthcare assistant, yeah. because they're less likely to have yeah. the up-to-date knowledge yeah. and, and, and information about your particular case. So something I found when I was in hospital recently was that uh, it helped to have someone on my side, a friend. Um, my boyfriend came in and sat with me. Yeah. Um, so he, because I, I was a bit drugged up at one point yeah. and, and didn't know the right questions to ask. So someone who's following me and supporting me yeah, throughout. Yeah, absolutely. I found really helpful. Um, and I would say, you know, if you, um, if, if it's one of your relatives and they're on their own mm. um, and you can't get to see them um, yourself, and you can't be there when the doctors are visiting because annoyingly they tend to do their ward rounds in the, yeah. in the morning yeah, and it's not always, exactly, it's not yeah. always convenient. Um, speak to the ward 
um, to one of the actual nurses, not just one of the anyone that answers the phone, speak to actually one of the nurses mm-hmm. and say, when is a good time for me to call? When is convenient for you? Yeah. Because then you're more likely to get the most amount okay. of their time and you, know, you won't be stressing them out. Um, and, and make an arrangement to speak to them either every day or every other day to get a pro- progress. progress. Um, and if you come from a big family, nominate one person to do that rather, rather than, than all of you doing in. it. Okay. Get one person okay. to do it. Because of course the nurses, every time they're speaking to the fo- uh, on the phone speaking to you, that means they're not giving somebody else um, the care and attention that they need. But overall you say really very little risk. Oh, abs- absolutely. Don't, don't worry. And don't honest, worry. Don't yeah, believe all you read. Absolutely fine. <laughs> if anything, if you are worried at all, there, there's also there's always the PALS service, so the patient liaison service in the hospital. So if you are in on your own. In every hospital. In every hospital. So if you are on your own, you, know, you haven't got anyone to advocate for you, that is their job. I didn't know about that. That's so you can go and speak to And how do you find out about that you before can, you go in? It, you can go you can find out about them if you want before you go in or you can ask any of the nursing staff any of the junior doctors they'll all know about it just say I'd like to speak to someone from PALS they'll come up if you've got any problems any complaints they'll come up they'll help you they'll help explain stuff to you they'll make sure if anything is confusing they'll They'll make sure you understand it it's a brilliant service you must use it thank you next now I can identify with this I've got a slow pulse anything from about 48 to 60 I don't know if I've always had it, but I've certainly had it for many years. I'm not especially fit, although I'm not overweight. Is it normal? Because the normal pulse rate is what, about 70, 72? Yeah. Um, what, what, what this person is describing, medically, we would call it bradycardia. Um, so they have a bradycardic pulse. Now, um, as with lots of things in medicine, it sounds mean? really nice and posh, <laughs> um, but actually it's really easy. That's why I love medicine. It's easy. Mm. You just say the obvious, just yeah. say it in a bit of Greek. Yeah. Um, and the brady just means slow. Slow. Cardiac, yeah. you know, cardia heart. just means heart. Yeah. So it just, it's just saying heart, slow heart. Because, of course, your pulse, all your pulse just is your really, rate, it? it's your heart rate. It's yeah. the number of times your, your heart is beating, is contracting yeah. in one minute. Yeah. Now... So if you have a pulse of six, of uh, about, around about 60, that is technically, between, mm. between late 40s, so 48 or so, and 60, mm. we would call that bradycardia. Right. Um, so we call that a slow pulse. It's, it's officially mm. a slow pulse. Mm. Tachycardia is anything over 100, and that means it's right. overly oh, fast. Yes. Now, bradycardia can just be normal. So it, it can just be normal for people to have a, a slow pulse. I had, right up in, throughout my 20s, I had a really slow pulse, about sort of 55. Mm. Um, if, you, if you do it with most athletes, they will have a very slow pulse. Because mm, they're very fit. Exactly. So they're, because yeah. their heart is so efficient that, for every, you know, that every time it contracts, it actually it doesn't need to do a lot of contractions in a minute because it's so efficient. Yeah. Um, so it could just be that you know, genetically you're predisposed, you've got a healthy, good, effective, um, you know, well-working heart, mm. um, no concerns, it's all fine. Mm. That could hopefully, mm. fingers crossed be the answer. Mm. Sometimes though, <laughs> it can be because, you, your, your heart rate can be slow because there's an electrical wiring problem with the heart. Right. So the heart contracts, it pumps, um, because it's being told to by little electrical uh, impulses. Mm. Um, now if it's a bit faulty, um, and it's not being told to be quite as much as it should do, mm. you can then get a bradycardia, you can get a slow pulse. Right. Um, if that's the case though, you would be able to tell because your oxygen in your blood wouldn't be quite as high as it should be. Mm. Um, and you can How test that, that very easy. The doctor can do that very easy. They just put like a little, it's got a pulse oxometer, mm. they call it. It's just like the a little pulse clip. pulse oxometer? You know the little, the little um, Oh, I know. Thing. Yes, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah the little clip thing yes. on, your, on your finger. Yeah. And it will show you the saturation. That, all yeah. that means is just how much oxygen is kind of saturated in your blood, how saturated your blood is. And that will tell you straight away whether it's working. Yeah, so if it's like 99% yeah. on air, yeah. it's perfect. So is that... If it's a bit lower than that, you so might sh- sort of think... should this person just go and... So I would go, yeah. to be honest, again, an easy 10 minutes, mm. you can get mm. this sorted out. It's, you just need an ECD, a tracing of the heart, which mm. just looks at the electrical impulses around the heart to check they're normal, mm. and also just, just check the level and of oxygen that, in the that blood. Thing? what does what's, the, what's a bad level of oxygen? Well, <laughs> it, it could be anything. I mean, you know, I've seen people with, with it sort of 80%, yeah. um, who, you know, you would get short of breath by that yeah. point, um, and you, you might look what we would call sinus, you might sort of look yeah. slightly blue around the lips, yeah. like that kind of, that kind of, <laughs> because you're not getting enough oxygenated blood, and oxygenated blood oh, is Oh, is like that why they check red. for blue uh, fingernails? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. So, so no, if you're it. if you're becoming hypoxic, not enough oxygen, see, I'm good. No, you're fine. Um, yeah. Then, then, then that's what they would look for. Yeah. Oh, um, interesting. So, I mean, easy, easy to be sorted out. GP can sort that out yeah. in sort of no time. GPs know everything, don't they? Well, um, <laughs> sometimes. No. Next question: How long does it take for a general anaesthetic to get out of your system? Is there well, such a thing as a general anaesthetic? Well, I so suppose yes. The, you know, this is this is the kind of myth that we perhaps need to bust here. That yeah. actually general anaesthetic refers to lots of different types of drugs yeah. that are used. Um, you know, we all know that there's general anaesthetic and local anaesthetic. So general anaesthetic is where you go to sleep yeah. for an operation, and yeah. local is just it's where just, they numb the area. Yeah. Um, yeah. But actually, within general anaesthetic, there's lots and lots of different chemicals, lots of different medicines that they use to make you firstly go to sleep, then to keep you in a, in a sleep and make you... Something's going to so you it's not asleep. just one injection not, no, that knocks no. you out? Of course, you only remember that one that makes yes. you no, knock yes. you out. But actually, after that, they then give you a whole lot of other ones. Oh. But you're, you're asleep, so you don't know. Um, um, and, and also, there's all sorts of different types of drugs that do different things. So sometimes when you're having um, certain operations, they might give you a drug like midazolam, for example, oh. um, which sort of makes it it's like a very strong gin and tonic. It sort of makes you all spaced oh, out. That's right. Um, but I'll, I'll have two. <laughs> but and it, but it makes you forget, so you can't you can't remember the right. procedure you had. Yeah. So okay. you know, um, so sometimes they use that instead of a full general. It's anesthetic. very handy for medical negligence, isn't it? Well, <laughs> anyway, we'll gloss over so, that. Um, so there can be all these different um, things, and they all take a different uh, period of time for the body to break down. Okay. Um, most people, after a general anaesthetic, again, depending on what they've had yeah. and for how long they've had it, it usually takes them a couple of hours to recover. Right. Often the general anaesthetic is still what, around. To come their, out of it. Yeah, yeah, to kind of fully, fully um, sort of you know woken up to be able to get up and walk around. Okay. Um, it takes a long, a long time. I think people often forget um, or don't realise yeah. um, that these drugs, you know, that what's well, happened powerful, to your body, they? yeah, they're, they're powerful drugs, and what's happened to your body is often quite serious. Yeah. So um, it usually takes a good couple of hours for someone to come round fully and to be able to then sort of eat and drink yeah. and things like that. Even then, sometimes it takes it can take even longer. Um, and and of course, when we think about the the general anaesthetic. Often in an operation, there's also been local anaesthetic has been used as well. So when you wake up, people often, 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 for about sort of six to eight hours, mm. think, oh, do you know what, it doesn't hurt anymore. Um, oh, this is brilliant, you know, fantastic. No. And actually, the general anaesthetic has worn off, but the local anaesthetic that's been injected into the area not, is still there. Yeah. And, mm. and, and that's why sort of several hours after operation, often that's when people start complaining Because sometimes I've heard people say, oh, do you know it takes months to get it out of your system? No, it's not months. Uh, is, it, no. is it really that long? No, but um, I mean, in some people, particularly in older people, they can have a reaction to the, the, um, the general anaesthetic. Now that doesn't mean that they have an allergic reaction, that's something different, right. but often, an anaesthetic can change the blood flow to the brain. Right. And this happened to my gran, actually, right. when she had a hip operation. For about three months after, she was very confused. Um, now, that, it, was n it wasn't because the anaesthetic was still in her, in her body making her confused, but it was because the brain had... Interrupted the blood flow? Or? Exactly, it yeah. interrupted the blood flow, because you know, it's a difficult thing to, make, to put someone unconscious. Um, and when you're, my grandma was very elderly and already had Alzheimer's, so you've, she already had a very vulnerable um, so brain. It's, a, it's many factors exactly. beginning to exactly. interact. Exactly. So you yeah. already had a very vulnerable brain, and that often will happen to post-operative confusion. Yeah. Um, is 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 relatively common in older people. Um, now this is quite an open-ended question. How long should you take antidepressants for? Oh, that is a bit like mm. how long is that piece of string? Um, I, I understand exactly what this person is getting at. Yeah. Um, um, the fear for lots of people when they start taking antidepressants is, you know, is this going to be it for the yeah, rest of my life? And you're addicted to it. Yeah. Um, and I would say, firstly, categorically, antidepressants are not addictive. What none often, of them. No. What often happens is that one of the big misunderstandings, sometimes they're difficult to get off, that's different to being because addicted. Because you're emotionally addicted, I mean. Well, that, it's more because um, um, the, your body has got used to them, and so you have to wean yourself off them. Um, okay. And you okay. should be doing that with with a doctor or a psychiatrist helping okay. you. Um, and so, when, so sometimes what people what happens is people just stop taking them, feel dreadful, and then they think, oh, well, it's because I'm addicted. It's not. No, it's, it's because just your body's going. Your body well. has not. Yeah, it needs to be. It just as it takes a while to kind of get on into them and get used to taking okay. them. Similarly, it takes a while to get your body out of them. It's not an addiction in the same way that you know cigarettes or okay. heroin is addictive. Okay. It's so it's not addiction in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, 
But also, of course, sometimes people, when they stop taking them, feel awful because they're working. I mean, this is the thing. Mm. Um, and it, you know, that's not an addiction. It's no, that's not, you know, insulin is not addictive for a diabetic, but you know, the diabetic can't stop taking it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and, and in a similar way, sometimes people um, who are taking antidepressants, when they stop taking them, feel worse. Um, and that's because they're actually, their depression is still there and their antidepressant is still treating it. Um, now, the, the kind of guidelines are roughly, you should probably, after a depressive episode, you should usually be on antidepressants for about six months to oh, a year. That's quite a long time. Six you months can to see a year, why roughly. people are, are, yeah. are worried and about taking drugs for that length yeah. of time. Um, some people need to take it for a couple of years. There are, of course, some people that take them for even longer than that. Yeah. Um, but the vast majority of people, after a depressive illness, would be usually about six months to a year. But again, you need to speak to the doctor. Don't just suddenly stop taking them. Mm. It's always like the biggest problem is when people just suddenly stop taking their antidepressant. Mm. And talk to the doctor. He can then monitor you or she can then monitor you um, closely to check that you don't get any but symptoms. That makes sense because you'd have gradually built up as you exactly. started taking yep. it. So, yeah. And they can then help you slowly take, um, mm. uh, get off them. But um, the most important thing is that they're not addictive. They are not addictive. And if you've know, any concern or... or um, you, you're not sure about it in any way, on the Royal College of Psychiatrists website there is a whole um, information leaflet mm -hmm. um, about um, antidepressants and they deal with the whole question of like, are they addictive? And there's a whole thing about it. So the Royal on College website. of Psychiatrists yeah. website is very, okay. very good. Okay. Um, now, oh, it's a difficult one. My mother is getting increasingly confused. She trails off in the middle of sentences and looks vacant. Her house is much messier than it used to be. I've noticed food stains on her clothes when I visit, which never used to be the case. She lives on her own but won't hear of having any help. Remember, my mother was exactly like that. What can I do to make sure she's okay? I'm terrified that she might do something like leave the iron on or the front yeah. door open at night. This must be happening oh, this all is over such the, a common the country. Problem. I mean, it what can you do if they heart. refuse help? It's what really, really difficult. Do? I think with, in, the, in the case of this person's mum, the first thing that needs to happen is there needs to be a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. We don't even know what we're dealing with here. Yeah. Now, it could be in older people, the, 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 the kind of story that she's describing could actually be a number of, lots of well, it could be yeah, a lot of different things. Things. It could be depression. Um, older people often present when they're depressed with this kind of picture. Yeah. Um, it could be a dementing illness, so one of the dementias. Yeah. And dementia is an umbrella term yeah. for any problem with thinking and memory. Yeah. So it could be that. Yeah. If it is a dementia, you want to know what type of dementia yeah. it is, um, because there's different ways of treating and managing the different types of dementia. But how do you get her to have help if she's just refusing? Well, I think this, this is where it then comes into <clears throat> being in, important what the diagnosis is. Yeah. Because actually, if it's a, if it's a depressive illness and um, um, and she then receives treatment, maybe things will improve, the social mm. situation should then improve, but she doesn't need any extra help. Mm. If this is um, a severe enduring illness that is only going to get worse, mm. like a dementing illness, mm. you know, Alzheimer's mm. or one of the different types of dementia, then you're going to have to inevitably deal with the, the situation of at what point does she not have capacity mm. to make the decisions. Um, about her living arrangement. But how do you get the diagnosis in the so first So the first place, thing so. to do is to go to the GP. Now the GP, in this situation, I, I personally think this is quite serious, mm -hmm. and I would insist on a referral to your local um, elderly mental health services. Mm -hmm. um, and all the different kind of um, uh, names like COOP, um, so mm -hmm. the Care for Older People's right. Mental Health Services. Oh, that but basically, um, you want to see, see an old age psychiatrist. Yeah, okay. So that is what I would push for. Yeah. And they are um, you know, a, a group of uh, doctors um, who specialise in making diagnoses around, you know, is this dementia, is it depression, and what is wrong? And they can get to do a diagnosis even though the mother sounds like she will refuse to have it. They, would think that they have ways, ways and means. Honestly, I've had referrals like this ah, thousands of times. Interesting. Um, you know, you, you will go there, you persevere. It's not a hit squad comes around at exactly. night or anything. You persevere. Yeah. And actually, if things are, are so worrying, um, you know, there are then pieces of legislation you can employ as a doctor yeah. to, to actually force somebody into hospital so you can assess them. Gosh. And if you're that worried, I mean, you know, I'm sure it won't come to this. That sounds very like unusual. Big Brother, but at the same yeah, time, it's very unusual to ever have to use that. But you yeah. know, because there are lots of people um, 
like this who are very, very vulnerable, who don't realise there's anything wrong. And it's well, because to them duty. it's a very gradual decline exactly. and you don't realise yeah. how bad it's exactly. gone, maybe. And, and you know, the doctors have a duty of care to these people. So I would say go to the GP mm. um, and, and you can then you know, raise your concerns. If your mum won't could, come could with you... Could a friend or a neighbour do that as well? Or does it just have to be a blood you can You can alert the GP. I mean, again, there's lots of issues around patient confidentiality. So that mm. it's unlikely they'll be able to tell you what's going to happen. Yes. But you can alert the GP yeah. and say... This is happening to my neighbour. I'm really worried. Or this happened to my friend or my okay. mum or anything. I'm really worried, and and insist then that they make a referral to the the old age psychiatrist. Okay. Um, and again, they might they'll get social services. Um, so, uh, a so first quarter call. There's a whole got to go to the GP. Exactly. There's a okay. whole process. Okay. The GP is the person who start it off. Right. Completely different question now. My husband is very concerned about his baldness, which is leaving him with some very uneven patches on his scalp. Is there any way the NHS can offer help? Or is that seen as being too frivolous? This is difficult. Again, mm. right. Well, <clears throat> this very much depends what type of baldness it is. Um, now, if it's just typical male pattern baldness, which is just, you know, the I say just, but you know, it's also mm. very distressing for mm. lots of men, but it but is classic. It's the classic yeah. uh, pattern. Yeah. Um, now, what makes me this think that very maybe uneven that, patches, I know, see, that's very uneven. I know, that makes me think that it's maybe not necessarily that. Um, now, if it, if it is just the, the typical male pattern baldness, um, there are various treatments out there. There's um, uh, products you can put topically onto mm. the onto that the hair. you can get on the NHS. Um, uh, no. Oh. <laughs> so there's topical there's topical treatments, and there's also oral medication. Right. Now they are not available right. on the NHS. However, there are other causes of hair loss, mm. and they should be investigated by the GP. Mm. Now, you can go to a private clinic and they'll investigate mm. it for you and charge you loads of money. Yeah. It's actually perfectly fine to go to the GP and say, look, I've got this hair loss, Do what's going on? It's... And they will be able to just look at it and say, it's male pattern baldness, yeah. it's fine, you know, this is a genetic yeah. thing, it's just yeah. one of those things, yeah. nothing we can do for it. Okay. They might sit there and say, do you know what, it could be a problem with your thyroid, yeah. it could be okay. this, is this. Your GP's and they would not do... going to laugh you out of court. No, though, it, and it's yeah. a really serious thing, and I think, you know, that it, it really dramatically impacts on people's mm. lives and their kind of self-esteem and so on, and, and I actually, I do take it very, very seriously. Yeah. And, and so I would say, go to the GP, ask them to have a look at it, to see what they think about it. It might be that they think, actually, there's something else going on here, we need yeah. to refer you to a dermatologist. At least you can understand what you're dealing with. Exactly. Somebody. If, if yeah. you then know... Do you know what this is? It's been diagnosed as just male pattern baldness. Mm. That's definitely what it is. Then you can go along to one of these clinics. Boots offer um, these kind of um, uh, drop in uh, things where you meet with a pharmacist. They can mm. talk through the different options. Again, all of the, the treatments, they've got side effects, they're not perfect. But it's about weighing up you know, the pros yeah. and cons of yeah. something. What I would say though is go sooner rather than later. So if you do have male pattern baldness yeah. um, and you, you are going don't bald, leave it till you're bald, don't leave it till you're actually bald because all of these treatments work best when you get it earlier. Okay. Um, so, so go along, go to GP first, get it checked out, get it diagnosed and then go along um, if you wanted to get some treatment to things, um, someone like basically, boots. Basically, it's okay to see your GP. Yeah, it's fine. But also, even, even if you are going bald, it's actually, I think it's quite a good look. I think, I, I I think it can be very good look. There you go, you see? <laughs> <laughs> right, here's a question. This is very much aimed at you, Max. I saw your tweet about CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, helping you to give up smoking, because you have had a little bit of a smoking habit, haven't you? I have, yes. Um, Tell me more, says this reader. Right. How has CBT well, helped you stop well, smoking? Because you have stopped, haven't you? I have, yes. Yes, thanks. Um, <laughs> and I've always been really honest about the fact that I smoked. And I've always, you know, I've smoked for years and years and years and years. And I've oh. smoked, I've always been quite a heavy smoker as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I've sort of always felt that it was very much part of my character. Um, was that, you know, I, I'm the doctor that smokes. So I'm yeah. sort of, you know, slightly naughty and irreverent and so on. Get, get over it. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, I mean, this is the thing. And then, um, as I say, I sort of had this health scare. Um, a little while ago, yeah. where um, I had this cough for several months, and I just thought, do you know what? Maybe now is the time. Yeah. What's this really doing for me? And I thought, there's all these different ways of stopping smoking. Yeah. Um, and I'd written a piece actually for Reader's Digest about, you doing it? about the, you you know, doing the original it, yes. Reader's Digest piece that had started off the whole, you yeah. know, informed the public. Well, about the link between smoking, smoking and cancer. Smoking cancer, exactly. Yeah. And, and to be honest, when I was researching it, I was reading all this stuff up about smoking and um, and even though I knew it, all the statistics about smoking, because you know, I'm a doctor, mm. when I was reading about it and thinking, do you know what, this has been out there for so long, and yet I've still chosen to do this. Isn't and you know, my grandparents, when they read that Reader's mm. Digest article, they gave up smoking on that day. 
and I, I'm still made that cho- that choice. How stupid of me! And so I just sort of sat down. And I thought there's all these different ways of giving up smoking, but actually I want. And this again, it was just personal to me. I want to be able to feel I've taken control of this. Mm. That I haven't had to rely on something else to get me off it. That mm. I've taken control. Of this. this is a decision I've made because what I didn't want to do was to ten years down the line or twenty years down the line look back and and think, oh, do you remember when I used to smoke? Oh, that was nice. Mm. I thought I've got to change my thinking around smoking. Mm. And that is what will get me off. Um, I know there's kind of various stuff, there's like Alan Carr and various other kind of hypnosis and stuff. And I thought, I, as a, as a doctor and someone who's trained in psychiatry, yeah. I should be able to do this myself. Yeah. So <laughs> I um, employed some of the techniques. Physician heal thyself, exactly, I'm sorry, I just exactly. had to say that. Anyway. So I employed some of the techniques that you would learn in CBT, which is cognitive behavioural therapy, mm. and I applied those techniques to my so give attitudes me, give me an around example. smoking. So say for example, so, so I I'm challenge part, I offer you a cigarette. Well actually I had this last night. Oh, right. so I, offer you a cigarette. <laughs> I always assume so for example, one of my thinking patterns around smoking was it made me relax. Yeah. And so I then thought very carefully around do I always use a cigarette to relax? And I don't, because in yeah. certain situations you yeah. can't. Yes. Um, yeah. what other techniques do I use? And actually does it really make me relax? And I sort of really unpacked all of that thinking around cigarettes equals relaxing. Yes. And then, and I realised actually that was a fantasy, it wasn't true. It doesn't relax you, it makes you, it stimulates you. Exactly, anyways, exactly. It, yeah. I mean, this is the whole thing, but you know, I'd kind of fallen into this lie. Yeah. So then I did it with other things. Um, you know, it makes you more sociable. And I thought, well, actually, lots of my friends don't smoke and they're still really sociable. And one of the most sociable, gregarious, most popular people I know is a non smoker. Yeah. And I was thinking, well, hang on, she can be a non smoker. It she actually says, doesn't yeah. make you. And so then I sort of unpack mm. that thing. And I just basically, all of the different thoughts and you thinking just readdressed had, your old way of thinking. Yes, in this exactly. Way, and so, so, so that's it. It took me quite a while. I'll be honest, it took me a good couple of weeks. I mm. sat down and I made Seems myself have special... Well, I made myself have a special kind of, like, a particular time each day where I would just think about smoking. Mm. Um, and so I did that and unpacked all this stuff. And then I was about to go on holiday and so I set this date. And I thought, right, I'm going to do it. And I already had in my mind about preparing yeah. to say to people, I don't smoke, I don't smoke. And that, so that I had this thing, what would happen when people offer me a cigarette? Yeah. What I would say, I prepared everything so in my mind. So you visualised yourself as exactly. a non-smoker. Which is exactly, it's exactly what would happen in, in the CBT model, yeah. which is used to treat, say, depression or anxiety or yeah. um, obsessive compulsive disorder, all these things. Yeah. So I just applied the same te- techniques to smoking. So far, it has worked. And it's touch wood. And so I just stopped. So I just went cold turkey, <laughs> and it was fine. You get the odd pang, but then I just think around what and that you're means. Still as nice as you've ever been. So you haven't had there a we personality go. change. So yeah. <laughs> right, on that very positive note, thanks for coming in and answering so many readers' questions. It's been a pleasure.